where next for biology today on Mendel's Pod. Welcome to the opening show of our 14th season. How about that? We started podcasting before Amazon sold out of microphones and pajamas. And back when the $1,000 genome was on the wish list for everyone, today we're living in somewhat of a post-genomics world of biology. We talk more proteomics now, spatial biology. Not that genomics is not important, but biology is looking for new answers. And perhaps we will understand the complicated way of the genome in some time, maybe with AI, surely we'll understand genomics better. In the meantime, biologists are moving on, such as today's guest. Michael Levin is a developmental and synthetic biologist at Tufts University, where he is the Vannevar Bush Distinguished Professor. He is a director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and also the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. He has a Weiss appointment at Harvard. Michael Levin, welcome to Mendel's Pod for the first time. Thank you so much. Yeah, real pleasure to be here. You are very busy. You do a lot of these uh, media and interviews. I think that's just fantastic. Thank you for uh, joining us on our biology show. Uh, just to start out here, I, I read on Wikipedia last night that you were born in Moscow and your family moved to Massachusetts in, in the late 70s. Your father was a computer programmer, worked for the Soviet Weather Service and your mom was a concert pianist. Right. <laughs> Could we just start out? So, so what do you remember about that move, and, um, and how did you get into biology? Uh, well, I remember everything about the move, but I got into biology well before that. Um, I, some of my earliest memories were that uh, I, I, I was a pretty sickly kid. I had asthma, and we didn't have access to any kind of medications, and so during asthma attacks, one of the things my dad would do is uh, take the back off of this ancient TV set full of tubes, you know, vacuum tubes, and it would glow and all of this. And we would sit there and look at the back of it. And I remember uh, this was a formative memory for me because I remember looking at it and just being uh, absolutely struck by the fact that somebody knew how to put all that stuff in there. And it was obviously not random. Somebody, somebody knew how to do it. And wow. it was there, right? It was there in the way that uh, made the, you know, the cartoons and everything else come up the other end. And so that, that, uh, that engineering, right? I asked him, I said, so can, can I, you know, can anybody learn to do this? And he said, yeah, anybody can learn to do this. I thought, well, that's amazing. That's, that, that's it. And so, and so there, that was kind of my love for engineering, but um, I had a, I had a friend when I was about six or seven, I think I, I also had a friend who was, uh, he was slightly older. He was super into insects, bugs, insects, uh, caterpillars, beetles, you know, and we would go outside and he would, you know, we would, we would turn over rocks and look at these things and he would show me these things and say, okay, so, so here's a butterfly and it lays this egg and this little, this little white thing is going to turn into a caterpillar. By the way, not a butterfly, but it turns into a caterpillar and the caterpillar is going to do some, you know, have certain behaviors and, and whatever. And then the caterpillar is going to turn into something else. It's going to turn into a butterfly and that cycle is going to continue. And this was just, you know, you know mind blowing for me and thinking about uh, what is going on there. And if we are the engineers who can make TV sets and everything, where did the tiny little parts of the biology come from and what makes them different and why do they seem to have goals and preferences about what happens next whereas the tv didn't really seem to have any uh and so that and then later later once we moved here i had access to a computer and so i was you know became interested in programming and software my first my first degree was in was in computer science so that's i mean that's it it's, it's from a very early age i was i was interested in these things uh let's start with your cell press paper that came out late last year i think in september uh you and your co-author eric lagasa uh, you write, um, and I'll quote, we review data suggesting that the multi-scale competency of living forms affords a new path for biomedicine that exploits the innate collective intelligence of tissues and organs. The concept of tissue level allostatic goal directedness is already bearing fruit in clinical practice. Um, how would you summarize your research? Yeah. Uh, so my, my group does a, a huge number of different things. We, our applications are in cancer, birth defects, regeneration. We do some AI work. We do some, some basic philosophy and cognitive science. All of it has one thing in common, which is that we are, I, I am interested in understanding embodied mind. I'm interested in understanding how intelligence and all kinds of unfamiliar guises, so not just brainy animals, but cells, slime molds, uh, minimal matter, molecular networks, how, how these things have memory, how they solve problems, how they have preferences, and, and how they scale. How does cognition scale in the physical world, given that we all start off as a single cell? 
you know, this unfertilized oocyte little blob of chemistry and physics. And then nine months and some years later, you get to this uh, complex metacognitive human who certainly doesn't feel like a single cell full of you know, chemistry and, uh, and physics. And so, so I'm interested in that, in that scaling process now. The thing, the thing about that paper, and that was, uh, you know, uh, Eric is a, was a fantastic person to uh, to, to do this with, um, uh, real, real avant-garde uh, biomedical thinker. Um, my, my, you know, my, my personal uh, approach to all of this stuff, and 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 what that that piece that you just read about, what it summarizes, is 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 two basic ideas. The first idea is imagine imagine what happened to computer science. What what was what was programming like in the 1940s and 50s? So if you look at a picture of what that looked like, uh, you know the operator might be sitting there, and what she's doing is she, she she's plugging wires in and out. Right? We can all picture it. I show it in my talks. The idea in is all that those World War II movies. Yeah, ex ex exactly. The the idea there is that in order to get it to do what you want it to do, you have to rewire the hardware. Okay. And in many ways, this is where I think molecular medicine is today. In other words, all the excitement is about the hardware. So there's genomic editing, there's a single molecule approaches, protein engineering, pathway rewiring, there's, um, uh, you know, epigenetic modifications to the, to the chromatin, and we got this amazing imaging technology and big data, but it's all about the hardware. Okay, it's all about with, with with a few exceptions. It's all of the interesting parts are about the hardware, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see what happened to the information technology revolution. Where when when we realized that we can make tools to take advantage of the reprogrammability of our medium, the fact that the 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 computer is actually highly reprogrammable, and you know when you switch from Photoshop to Microsoft Word, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring. We have a system that has. Uh, abstraction layers in an interface that allows you to 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 take advantage of its uh, reprogrammability. So so this is where I think the future is going. I think the biological material is incredibly reprogrammable, and we could talk about some examples that, that we've discovered. But that's kind of one metaphor is the is the shift not, not to abandon the, by so certainly by no means do we abandon molecular biology and right. genetics and all of that. But but and it's 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 fantastic to understand your hardware. But that's just the beginning of the story. It doesn't stop there. Then you get your software. And then, and then the other, the other you thing you would that argue wanna... that most biologists haven't been thinking about the software as much. Uh, is, there are there are certainly now approaches in terms of dynamical systems. So there are, of course, of now systems people who biology, are, systems biology, dynamical systems, control theory. I mean, this absolutely is a thing. But I want to I want to crank that knob to to eleven, so to speak, in the in the in the <laughs> following way, because because I want to go beyond this idea of information and software, and I want to go to actual intelligence and cognition. Okay, and, and I want to I'll, I'll explain you know what I, what I mean by that. But but the, but the other the other analogy that I want to start out by thinking about is how we engineer with materials. So so for thousands of years we've engineered passive matter, wood, metal, you know, the now plastic things like that. What's what 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 you have to know about engineering with passive materials is that you can't count on them to do much. All they do is hold their shape at best. So that means that you as an engineer, it, 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 it is on you to make them do everything you want them to do. Every bit of the outcome you have to design yourself, right? You have to design and implement everything you want them to do. Then, then you know, we went, there's some, there's now some active matter research and even some computational matter research, but, but in biology and medicine, we're dealing with something amazing. We're dealing with what I call an agential material. This is a substrate that we're engineering with that has its own agenda, its own ability to learn, its own uh, uh, goals and preferences and uh, ability to uh, solve certain kinds of problems, homeostatic, allostatic, and so on. That requires a completely different way of engineering. Whereas in the first way, uh, you as an engineer, it's a unidirectional, you are in control, you are going to micromanage. The good news is that there's not as many surprises, right? I mean, there's some, but, but, but you know, you, you, it's on you to make it do everything. The bad news is that it's on you to do absolutely everything, okay? In the case of the agential material, there's going to be tons of surprises because you cannot engineer or in control it the same way, but there's a, but there's a benefit, right? And the benefit is this. Imagine that uh, you're building a tower, you're building a tower out of Legos. If you build a tower out of Legos, you have to say where every single Lego goes, but you have full control over it. But then if it gets knocked over, that's it. You have to come back and fix it. Now imagine you're building a tower out of dogs. Can't do it the original way. You stack the dogs, they run away. Not going to work. But if you train the dogs, then you have something amazing. You have a tower that once you knock it over, it gets itself back up and you don't need to be there to worry about it. Also, you don't have to micromanage where everybody's paw goes away, every, every neuron and, you know. So, so why does that work? It works because uh, living things expose this amazing interface, the learning interface, where you get to offload all of your complexity onto the system itself. 
you don't know how they're doing everything, but what you do know is how to motivate the system to do what you want it to do at the level of communication, not micromanagement. We're not playing it like a puppet where you control all the neurons, right? That would take a very long time if, it, if that's even possible. But, but by using this interface, you can reach, achieve these amazing things where you don't have to control the bottom layers. So, um, you know, I'll stop here to just say that what I think is possible in biology is that uh, not just brains, but all layers of from from the molecular, not even the cellular, from from the molecular networks up, all of these layers have amazing top down interfaces that we can access to get buy in from the system to get it to commit to what you want it to do, and thus achieve applications in regenerative medicine that uh, we have no idea how to how to micromanage. Let's get into the the level of the tissue then. What is bioelectricity? Okay. So, so one reason bioelectricity is interesting is that it, it is one of these interfaces that scales the intelligence of individual cells into individual into the intelligence of, uh, of of tissues and organs as they traverse anatomical space. So one way to think about this. So let's just let me just uh, set 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 the scene here. Imagine that. Um, uh, you have a, a tadpole, and the tadpole is going to become a frog. In order for the tadpole to become a frog, they have to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move, the jaws have to move, all these things have to move. And you might imagine, and it was thought until a few years ago, it was thought that that is a hardwired process. Somehow uh, what's encoded is that every organ moves in a particular direction, a particular amount, and then uh, you get your normal tadpole becomes a normal frog. Now, mm -hmm. the way you test for intelligence in any of these systems is you put a barrier between them and their goal. You change the circumstances and you see how much capability does this thing have to get its goals met even when things change. It's William James. That, that's sort of a working definition of intelligence for you. Exactly. Yeah, to it's William James's goal. It's, it's the degree of, of competency you have of, of accomplishing your goals by various means, right? That by, when, when, when things change, and not just the environment changes, but your own parts change. For biology, this is critical because I could give you some amazing examples where it's not just the environment that's changed, but your own parts you can't even count on staying the same. And living systems find a way around it. So what happens in the case of the tadpole, so we tried it. What, what we did was we made a, um, uh, what we call a Picasso tadpole, scrambled every, you know, the eyes on top of the head, the jaws are off to the side. Every, everything is just the total, you know, like Mr. Potato. You mean everything. genetically? How did you do that? Uh, there are many ways to do it. Uh, you can you can do it by misexpressing RNAs of various types. You can do it bioelectrically, which I'll talk about momentarily. Oh, okay. Okay. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter. There, there, it's surgically, you can do it surgically. There, there are many ways. Surgically, to yes, of course, there's good old basic right. surgery. Like you, can, you can just move <laughs> stuff around. And so so what we found is something amazing is that is that these things actually make quite normal frogs. And that's because every organ will move in novel paths to end up where it needs to go, and then they stop. So this, It will this, get to that goal. It will get to that goal in new paths. Sometimes it goes too far and has a double back and everything sort of shifts around and eventually it gets to a frog face. So that, so that uh, does two things for you. First of all, it tells you that you cannot assume the intelligence of these systems. You can't assume hardwire. You have to test it. You have to do experiments to ask what is it actually capable of, okay? That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that what you have here is a, is a homeostatic uh, error minimizing system. The genetics did not give you a hardwired machine that does the same thing every single time. What it gave you is, uh, is hardware that can actually adapt in a context-sensitive nature to novel perturbations to get its goal met despite various changes. So that makes you, that makes you um, have to ask two, two fundamental questions, and this is what bioelectricity is all about. The first question is, how does it remember what the correct frog face is? Okay, all these cells are going to move around. How does it know when to stop? How does it know where it's going? Where is the set point stored in your thermostat? You have to, it, it has to have a circuit that stores what is the correct temperature range. Oh, so would another way of asking that question be, where does it hold on to the goal? Where does the goal yeah, live? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and this already is, I mean, keep in mind, this already is very much a taboo topic because in biology, we're not supposed to think about goals. We're supposed to to think about emergence from chemical signals. You're not supposed to think that these things are in some way moving towards a goal. Now, when right. I say a goal- That's too mind, Aristotelian. I mean, well, yes. And, 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 a lot, and, and the other problem is that a lot of people jump to a very uh, grandiose definition of goal, which is a, a, a conscious, I know what my goal is. I know I can change my, you know, this is, this is not what I'm claiming at all. I'm using a, a very cybernetic uh, kind of guy. I'm lower down on that spectrum. I'm not saying anything about the, 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 you know, the, the conscious experience of this. All I'm saying is the system has, a, there's a set point. It tries very hard by expenditure of energy and various competencies to get to that set point. And it will do so even when you try to prevent it with some degree of intelligence. That's, that's what I mean by goals. It's a cybernetic, you know, it's a non-magical definition. Okay. So, so, so you need to know where the goals are stored. 
Uh, that's that's one thing. And the other thing you need to know is there's, there's something also very interesting here. Individual cells, I mean, biologists know all about goal states because we understand homeostasis of pH, of temperature, of hunger level, right? But mm -hmm. all of these things are scalars. They're single values that um, individual cells pursue these very humble little tiny goals in physiological space and metabolic space. You know, it's very, very small, it's very, very small goals. But in the case of the rearrangement of the face or the salamander limb, which you can amputate and then it'll regrow at any level, and then it stops when it makes a perfect salamander limb. In those cases, the goals that they're pursuing are really grandiose goals. No individual cell knows what a finger is or how many eyes you're supposed to have or any of that. It's, it's pursuing a journey in anatomical space instead of moving around in physiological state space or metabolic state space. It's moving in anatomical space, the space of all possible geometric configurations of the body. And it makes this journey. And if you, and if you like when we scramble the tadpole, you sort of shove it away to a different region of that space, it'll still get to where it's going. How does it happen that all of the cells are now uh, projecting their, their goal into a different problem space, anatomical space instead of physiological space? And... Uh, the the um, the goal is now enormous, right? So the scale, I, I call it the cognitive light cone. It's the size of the goals you're able to pursue. How, how does the scaling of these goals work? So bioelectricity is the answer to both of these questions. And, and uh, the, way, the way it works is basically this. Every cell, not just your neurons, but every cell has ion channels in its membrane. And most cells have gap junctional, meaning electrical synapse connections to other cells. And they make electrical networks. These electrical networks process information in very similar ways to what the brain is doing, but much slower. This is the ancient, if you wonder where did the brain get all of its tricks? How does it represent space and time? How does it uh, have memory? How does it um, join a bunch of neurons? I mean, we're a pile of you know neurons and some other cells. How do they join into an emergent individual that has uh, somewhat unified goals and memories and preferences, right? So, so in the brain, it's bioelectricity, but that's not a new trick. Evolution pick this up around the time of bacterial biofilms that you even bacterial biofilms already do this. So you're seeing this um, electricity between cells for networks of cells um, that that could be holding this uh, the, the goals um, as a as a proto brain. Uh, very much so. And I'm uh, yes, yes, very, very much so. Uh, and so and so the question is, OK, uh, the neurons in your brain join into a network that thinks about how to move you through three dimensional space. That came from a much more evolutionarily ancient brain, which was spread throughout the body, which is constantly thinking about how to move your configuration through anatomical space. You start as an egg, you need to end up with 10 fingers and 10 toes and two eyes and all this. That journey requires navigation. And much as the brain navigates you through 3D space with all kinds of tricks, the electrical networks of your embryonic tissues navigate you through anatomical space. It's exactly, exactly the same. And when we developed, when we evolved, um, and, and now we have a brain or, you know, other uh, animal forms have a brain. Uh, we kept this network of bioelectricity among our other organs. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. From, from the start of fertilization to your, to, to the end of life, that bioelectrical network is critical to keeping your body in place, keeping this to first developing it, defending it, repairing it and maintaining it against aging and cancer and things like that. Yeah. How much have you thought about how much aut autonomy you think it has, say, one organ from the brain? Because we always uh, talk about the brain being the command center. Well, the brain is the command center for activity in three dimensional space and maybe some muscle, some glands and things like that. I mean, you don't need a brain to do embryonic development. There's there's only a few. I mean, we, we found a few organs that do get input from the brain during morphogenesis, but most morphogenesis happens before you have an active brain. It does not require the brain. The brain is not, generally speaking, in charge of your morphogenesis. Okay, so so in the beginning, you you said you're interested in embodied mind, um, and I think one of the uh, intriguing parts of your research um, for me has been that it's it's positing an intermer an intermediary step or something between um, between mind and body, if I can mm -hmm. say so. And we often get caught on on two ends of that. You know, we often think of the mind whether it has causal powers of the body. Um, I, I tend to be in that camp. Um, and because, you know, if I intend to raise my arm, then uh, then my arm goes up. Uh, but then there's, there's more, like you said, um, the tradition of biology, which is just coming from chemistry. Um, the genome, which, you know, seems to be deterministic. Maybe it's not as deterministic as we thought. What you're calling the hardware. And in that world, 
uh, there's been, uh, they're limited of us. Usually they, they don't go for mind. So, so let me ask a question, which is what are your thoughts on mind? I mean, you're not, yeah. a, are, you're not a dualist or, or are you some kind of dualist? Um, I, I so let, let's, uh, let's, let's make it super practical. Okay. Because, because some of these philosophical things can be d debated endlessly and, 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 and that causes people to, to dismiss them. I want to make it, I want to make it extremely practical. Let's do this. Let's let's agree that for all of us, the acid test of any of these theories is whether they facilitate new applications in medicine, new research, and new discoveries. So I'm not interested in philosophical theories that that paint extra stuff onto the science, uh, you know, because it makes us feel good. My claim is I'm I'm only going to say things and I'm only going to pursue things that I think are actively making us uh, do better science and and which is important empirically detectably um, uh, new capabilities and new biomedical applications. So that's, uh, that's our goal. Okay. So I want to okay. be clear that's, that, that is my, that is my starting point. Now, having started there, here's the, here's where we have to be fearless. Now we cannot assume from, from a philosophical armchair that the way to deal with the optimal way to deal with uh, biomedical issues is from the level of chemistry. That's a common assumption, but we have to be clear. That's an assumption. We don't actually know that if you're going to be, if you're going to be uh, actually uh, uh, scientific about this, you have to entertain the possibility that tools from other levels of organization, and the tools that I like best are the tools that come from cognitive science, behavioral science, and neuroscience, that some of these tools are going to be useful for what we need to do. So my claim is very simple. Uh, I'm going to take, uh, uh, I'm going to appropriate from, from the neural and behavioral sciences tools having to do with uh, with with memory, with learning, with uh, perceptual illusions, with uh, top down control of uh, executive uh, goals over over the over the chemistry, uh, all of the molecular tools, so all of the uh, the ion channel kinds of things, optogenetics, all of the the, the uh, neurotransmitter drugs, uh, you know, the active inference framework. All, I'm going to steal all of that stuff from behavioral science, and I'm going to simply ask, what does it do for us in looking at uh, in looking at the control of body shape and function. And if the answer is actually it doesn't help at all, then we give up and we say chemistry is the way to go and we continue status quo. But what we have found actually is that that's not the case. We have made numerous discoveries that uh, by using these tools that, uh, that operate on the principles of looking for memories, looking for goals, looking for intelligence and so on, uh, these kind of tools are extremely uh, uh they pay off they pay off wildly in developmental biology and so and so for that reason and and, and regenerative medicine and so for that reason here's my my hypothesis was was very simple um morphogenesis meaning the creation of the body it's repaired during regeneration the the the, uh, the you know resistance to cancer and aging and so on all of these things are the behavior of a collective intelligence in anatomical space and that behavior and, and the other hypothesis was that behavior that and, and the gonna, collective intelligence in anatomical space could include we are, the, um, the intelligence in the brain could include intelligence in the organs yeah, I mean, we, so 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 it is not controversial that we are a collective intelligence of neurons operating in three-dimensional space, right? I mean, that that's it. And mm -hmm. and we even know the glue. We even know the cognitive glue that binds the individual neurons into a single into a single unified uh, mind. That would be by electricity in the brain. My point is the exact same thing happens in anatomical space, and it's and, and again the, the cognitive glue there is the bioelectrical networks of the rest of the body. So what does this allow us to do? So we developed the first. Okay, so so now it's 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 time for me to tell you how this has paid off because because otherwise you might think this is you know this is all craziness. So here's so here's here's how this has paid off so far. What we developed were the first tools, the first molecular tools, I should say, to read and write the memories of that collective intelligence. Neuroscientists do it in brains now. They can they can read brain state and they can you know at least a little bit you know people like Tanagawa and so on can can incept false memories into mice using optogenetics and things like that. We developed tools to read and write. The, the pattern memories of the body. So when you do this, you end with, for, so, so how do we do it? For example, with voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes, you can soak an embryo and you can watch all the electrical network states of all the cells as they're trying to figure out who's gonna be left, who's gonna be right, where the head goes, where does the tail go, all that. So, so you can read these things. You can use um, computational uh, tools to try to decode them. So this is just like neural decoding, right? When people try to read your mind by reading your brain state. So we could do neural decoding and we can say, okay, what is the pattern that these cells are going to try to build? 
the bioelectrical pattern memory comes before the gene expression and before the anatomy. So you can look and you say, oh, I see, this is where it wants to put the eyes. This is what it thinks a proper face looks like. This is where the limbs are going to go. This is the, the edges of the brain that it's going to demarcate out of that neural plate. So you can see all that. Now, now comes the, the really important part, which is it, it's all well and good to see these patterns, but to show that they're not epiphenomena, to, you, you have to ask, do they matter for anything, right? And this is where we learn to rewrite the patterns. And when you learn to rewrite those patterns, meaning change the, uh, the, the pattern of distribution of the voltage potentials across your you know, embryo limb, whatever, here, mm. here are some things you can do. You can convince uh, gut cells to build a full eye. So you can trigger new organ formation, complete organ formation in wow. other locations of the body, knowing mm. nothing about how to micromanage eye formation. I don't know how to build an eye from scratch. It has dozens of different cell types, extremely complex. I don't know how to do any of that. It doesn't matter. What you can do is communicate and, the and so you're just uh, by trial and error changing voltage here and there, and so, so and it's so it's not trial and error. So so back so originally back in you know 2000, 2002 when we were first doing this, it was trial and error because we needed to map out the space of possibilities. We didn't know how this worked. Now I, I was just going to ask that: Have you created a map for a certain organism? Uh, what would you call that? The voltage map? Uh, you can call it a voltage map. Uh, I, I call the whole effort cracking the bioelectric code. So what we the want to understand, code. Okay. Yeah. we want to we want to understand the mapping between the bioelectric code, code and the organs, uh, the organ shapes that it calls up. So at the beginning, you know, around 2000, uh, that was done by trial and error because we didn't know what we were looking at. The whole thing was considered completely insane. Yeah. Uh, there was no precedent for any of this, and so we were, you know, that that was that was trial and error. But uh, but at this point, there are a number of, of predictive computational platforms that we've created, and uh, we've done it enough in in certain model systems that we now have a pretty good idea of how to do these things. Now, our, this is just the beginning of the field. Our control is quite limited where um, the technology really needs to be developed. For example, most things are not transparent, which means that you can only see the surface layer. When you do these bioelectric measurement techniques, you can only see the surface layer of things. So uh -huh. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of technology that needs to be developed, but, 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 but here's the range of things that we can do. So we can call up new organs, Okay, we can induce repair of complex organs after defects, including genetic defects. So we can fix, you know, notch mutation, right? So notch critical neurogenesis gene. If you mutate, if you introduce a dominant notch mutant, the brain is completely screwed up. We can repair back to a to a perfectly normal brain with normal IQ, normal behavior. This is in the frog model, despite the, the notch mutation. Wow. Right? So I mean, this we, is I mean, we talk about gene therapy. I mean, this could this could really yeah. take gene therapy and, and put it on steroids. Absolutely. And, and, and I'll, I'll still, let's come back to that in a minute, because this is an important thing here about gene therapy. So, so, okay, so, so new organs, uh, repair, repair of birth defects, induction of regeneration. So in, in the frog model, again, at, at, at adult stages where it does not regenerate its limbs, we've shown induction of full on limb regeneration. Okay, so we can trigger uh, uh, we can trigger the, the repair. We don't. So, so the, the full growth of the leg takes about a year and a half. Our treatment is the first 24 hours. We don't micromanage it. This is not 3D printing. This is not telling the stem cells what to do. This is not controlling gene expression. You talk to the cells in the first 24 hours and you say, travel down the leg growth path, not the scarring path. And then you leave them alone. Because once you've set that, um, and this is how we repair the birth defects too, is we reset the pattern that says, this is what a proper brain should look like here. It should be this big, you know, this, this should be the pattern. And then you leave it alone and the cells consult the pattern and they build whatever the pattern says. Uh, and are you coming up with an encyclopedia of of directions? For instance, uh, the direction of you know come up with this limb um, yeah. looks like this and this and this in voltage language. I I, I don't know the, what would you would call yeah. that. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely the goal. Um, I mean, the okay, so, I, so I'm so, I'm following you. That's the important thing. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. want to make well, for sure. I mean, so so the intermediate goal is to come up with the exact uh, pattern that we want to induce specific organs. The long-term goal is to go even beyond that and to, and to use the bioelectrics as simply a communication interface to say to the cells, build whatever normally goes here. We know this is possible because we have the exact same treatment that induces legs in adult frogs and tails in tadpoles. The cells already know what goes there. You don't, we don't actually have to micromanage that part, even at the electrical level. So down, this, down the line, at some point, when we, when we really understand the code, we will be able to talk at a very high level. But right now, we're dealing with these patterns. And the last two things I want to I tell you about, one is uh, cancer normalization. So 
when we inject human oncogenes into these uh, frog models, what happens? First thing the oncogenes do is they cause the cells to detach electrically from their neighbors. When they detach from their neighbors, oh, really? they're no longer. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I they, mean, that's important can, to know. <laughs> it, it, it's it's absolutely well. Well, that basic fact was known since the '80s. So the fact that they lose gap junctional communication was known since the '80s. But but it hasn't been appreciated what, why this is important. The reason it's important is that when a cell is part of a, an electrical network, it loses a large chunk of its identity because the electrical information and other small molecules, you know, calcium, other small molecules, are being shared and processed such that that cell it can no longer pursue its own tiny little goals it's pursuing this this much larger goal that the collective remembers building a limb skin muscle you know whatever it's whatever it's building when the cell disconnects it basically rolls back to an amoeba state where that cognitive um, glycone shrinks down to the level of a single cell and as far as it's concerned the rest of the body is just external environment right everything of importance is one cell size it cannot remember any of this other giant stuff it was working on and at that point it's an amoeba living in this environment then you get metastasis and and you know over proliferation because you know at the expense of the environment you do whatever you want you just you're just uh -huh. a single cell at that point boy, so what boy, that's a, a deep question for identity um yes yes very, please continue very much so. Very, yeah. very much so. And, and I have a, and I have exactly a paper on this that talks about cancer as a dissociative identity disorder of the morphogenetic intelligence. That is exactly what this is. It, the, the border between self and world is fluid. It can grow and shrink. And, and, and a lot of the tools from uh, cognitive science and the identity, you know, dissociative identity kinds of things apply here. So what we've done, so, so we, so for the cancer case, we did, we did three things. And then, and then I want to come back to the gene therapy stuff. We did three things for, for cancer. One is you can use the voltage dyes as a diagnostic tool because you can see which cells are in the process of de de oh, decoupling. Yeah. Diagnostics hadn't even thought so that. It's a, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a sensor, right? That's, that's a B turns out you can trigger cancer, right? So you can trigger cancer, no oncogenes, no genetic damage, no carcinogens, just by disrupting the electrical communication between cells, you get full, you can get full on metastatic melanoma, just just from from a, a transient physiological disruption of communication, you don't need to actually break the hardware at all. It's software is enough to, to, to so software signal is enough to trigger it. And the best part of all is that you can you can prevent and normalize tumors made from human oncogenes by uh, forcibly reconnecting cells to their neighbors. No, no, uh, you know, the oncogene is still there. We're not fixing it. There's no gene therapy. The oncoprotein is blazing because we can label, you know, we label it. And you see yeah, it. It's blazing. Just programming. It doesn't matter because, because it's the software that drives. It's not the hardware that drives in the end. So if you, so some, as, as I was mentioning about the notch issue, some, and I'm not claiming all, but um, some hardware issues are reparable in physiological software. So, the, so, so cancer, so we can, we can reconnect cancer, not by killing the cells, not by fixing the genetic damage, but by reconnecting the cells to the large scale network that has as its goal, make normal muscle, make normal skin, make, you know, make, make whatever. And so, okay. um, yeah. So I want to talk to you about where this is going, but you were going to say something about gene therapy. Just the last, the last thing, right? So, so already here you see in these, in these, um, in these animals that have really strong um, oncoprotein expression, but no tumor, you already see a divergence between genetic information and the actual phenotype. If you were to sequence them, you find the mutation and you say, oh, these things are going to have a tumor and you'd be wrong because that's not predictive of the actual phenotype. So there's a couple of other really interesting cases where these things diverge, which is why it's really important to keep an eye on what the software is and what the hardware is. Uh, we, we, did this, we did this work in planaria and flatworms where the flatworms, they're, they're super regenerative. You can cut them into pieces, you know, in fact, hundreds of pieces, and every piece gives rise to a perfect little worm, right? So you can ask the question, how does it know how many heads to have? How, how does it know how many heads? You get a little fragment, how, how, how many heads should it grow? Now, you might say, well, it's got a genome, of course, and so it's, it's the normal, you know, the normal standard one head, right? Yeah. So what you can see is that there's, a, there's, a, there's an electrical circuit in the, in the, in the tissue that has a particular pattern and the pattern tells you how many heads you're going to have. If you come, come along and you modify that pattern, and by the way, the way we modify these patterns, we don't use electrodes, there are no magnets, there's no electromagnetics, it's, it's all by manipulating ion channels, ion channels and cap junctions, okay? It's mm -hmm. all, we're playing the interface that these cells are using to control each other's behavior, which mm -hmm. is hacking that same interface. What happens then is that if, if you change that pattern to say, no, you should have two heads, First, first of all, the, first of all, they make two heads, and we have, and we have these nice two-headed worms because the cells consult the pattern. They make two heads. But the remarkable thing is that if you keep cutting up the two-headed worms again in the future, and you can see where this is going, no more treatment of any kind in perpetuity, as many generations as you want, they will continue to be two-headed. Why? Because the information as to how many heads you should have 
is not actually nailed down in your genome. What, what is nailed down in your genome is an electrical circuit that by default, when the juice comes on, so to speak, by default, it lands on a pattern that says one, one head. But that circuit has a memory to it and it's reprogrammable. So when we come along and say, no, no, you should be two heads, it holds that pattern forever. And so now you can see that, that, that these, these tissues have a completely wild type genome, but a very different picture of what a normal planarian looks like. The goal has been rewritten. The goal of normal uh, regeneration and repair is now make two heads. So you and can that will always be so? That will always be, be so until we change it back. We can change it. We know how to change it back. But until we change it back, as far as we know, it's permanent. And, and you're is, you doing know, this already with the with the This worm. was years. We, we did this uh, years two, ago. You know, 15 years ago. Yeah. So, 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 so just imagine this, right? We take these two-headed worms. We throw them in the Charles. I mean, we're not going to do this, but you could you know, throw them in the Charles River. And a hundred years later, some scientists come along, they scoop up some worms. Oh, here's some one-headed worm. Here's some two-headed worms. Oh, cool. Let's sequence the genome to see where the speciation event happened, right? And guess what? There is no difference in the genome. There's the going to be no, nothing in the that, genome. That is, so that this, is not weird. So that's why I'm excited about it. So this could be some of the answer for us. Um, because, you know, I have to say, there's been a little bit of disappointment around genomics, yeah. uh, right? We know the answer's there. But this is, a, this is a, an extra <laughs> genomic um, event. This is outside the genome. It, it's not only outside the genome. I mean, for sure, like one, one way to think about this. Oh, and by the way, just one last thing about the worms. The other thing you can do by manipulating their electrical information is you can cause them to build heads appropriate to other species. So we've caused the worm to build a head with a brain shape and a distribution of stem cells and everything else appropriate to other species of worms, 100 to 150 million years distance. Okay, so you look at these worms and their, their shape does not match their, their genome. So um, one way to look at all this is as a new kind of epigenetics. Okay, there's a new biophysical factor. It happens to be in electricity, but we know how to deal with this because we know that that electrical networks eventually feed into changes of gene expression. So much like chromatin epigenetics, this is just another way, you know, another piece of biophysics that we need to keep track of. You know, like like chemical gradients and and you know physical forces and so on. That, that's one way to look at it. That's the conventional way to look at it. And, and already, I think that's a, that's 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 big enough. But I think the what's really going to change um, medicine and, and biology in the future is the realization that this is not just another piece of, uh, of of epigenetics. What this is is the actual medium of the decision making that the collective that the groups of cells are undertaking to know what to build. This is a completely different way of doing. Uh, of doing regenerative medicine, because instead of trying to control bottom up, we want to clamp symptoms using drugs, right? We want to clamp specific uh, pathways at specific levels. We want to turn on and off specific stem cells. We want to do 3D printing. Like all of, the, all of those kinds of things are bottom up micromanagement approaches. What we have the ability to do here is to use that interface to speak to the very highest levels of organization and say very simple things like you should have an extra eye or you should have a, a brain that's shaped like this or you should have a head over here and actually not sweat any of the details about how that's done. This is hugely enabling. By taking seriously the idea that this collective already knows what it's doing and that we don't have to micromanage everything, you gain two things. One uh, is you gain uh, an enormous amount of complexity with little effort. Okay, we don't have to, for the same reason that if you wanted to do for a rat to do some complicated behavior, you don't puppet it, you know, control it like a puppet by figuring out what all the neurons, where all the neurons go, you train the rat, right? It's much less, much less difficult. So Great for point. that same, for that same reason, this bioelectric interface allows you to do very complicated things that it will to be, you know, be another hundred years before we, we could micromanage them. I don't know why you'd want to micromanage it. But, but the other thing, the other thing you gain from this is um, really the fact that uh, all of these, well, all, all of these systems, um, you, 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 you know, when, when you're trying to make these changes, life, life have, having evolved on earth in a very competitive uh, uh, biosphere, life is extremely sensitive to being hacked. All the time you're at danger of being parasitized, hacked, exploited. Life is pretty good at telling when something like this is happening, which means that if you have a living system and you have a drug that's going to clamp one particular pathway, meaning that uh, you know you're 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 addressing the system at the lowest point of the hardware, it fights you. It's going to it's going to other things will will attempt to you know uh, regulate it. Will it will try to? It's, I mean, it's an obvious attack from outside, 
And I think this is what's responsible for a lot of the difficulty we have with systemic diseases. I mean, yes, of course, there are some very successful drugs targeting very specific things. But generally, the problem is you haven't got the tissue buy-in about what is going to happen. And when you clamp on, I mean, just imagine one day you're, you're going around your day and, and suddenly your arm goes like this and you know you didn't activate that nerve yourself. Like, okay, you know you're being hacked. You're going to do everything in your power to try to resist it. Mm -hmm. Right. right. To get back have, to that uh, stasis. To, to, Exactly. And, so, and, so, and, and so this is the difference of working with the body or working against a kind of exactly, exactly, stasis. Exactly. Because um, in your now, is it going to see this as a hack? <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? That's that's the thing. It it it, it might. So you have to get covered. Yeah. None, none, none of this is easy. But 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 here's the thing: you've got a third. Imagine you have a thermostat. When you want to change the the temperature of your room. You don't start rewiring the thermostat. It already has a set point. All you have to do is go uh, uh, change that set point, and it will do what it does best, which is to regulate to that set point. When mm -hmm. we change the number of heads in the planaria, they, it doesn't fight back. We don't have to try to say which stem cells and keep suppress certain genes and you know all the stuff that it takes to build a whole head of, a, of, a, of an organism. All you have to do is convince it that it wants to have two heads. And the way, and specifically the way, I mean, I'm using this flowery language, but 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 it's I mean it's true. What you're doing is you're simply rewiring the you're you're editing the set point, not the hardware, but the information structure that the hardware is 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 paying attention to. And then yeah. it it has it has nothing to compare it with, right? Those cells. That's the that's the, how many heads we should have. What else is it going to compare? Uh -huh. it to? none to compare it to. So that's the important thing there. Okay, yeah. got it. So you know I could listen to you talk about this uh, new biology for. I mean, and I do, I, I watch all your videos, um, but I just have you for the hour. What I would love to do is kind of zoom out a little bit. So what what were you calling this field? What? Well, which field? I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, there is there is an emergent uh, field called uh, diverse intelligence, which is all about diverse people trying to understand, right? The, the big, the big uh, field is diverse intelligence. Uh, what I like to do is to use the, is to use cells and morphogenesis as an example of diverse intelligence, and the applications, okay. right? The applications of doing this end up in regenerative medicine. So birth defects, re, uh, re, you know, repair, um, cancer, and uh, bioengineering, because we make a bunch of synthetic things that have never existed before either. Right, and you've just given us a bit of a window into what what could be possible there. So, what is the roadmap for you now? I mean, I mean this. I mean, I, I know you're talking to a lot of people, so that's a reflection of your excitement. What would you love to see happen? For instance, would, would you love to see a shift of funding at the NIH from the gene to bioelectricity or, uh, or you know, differential intelligence? Um, how, how would, in the best case scenario, how would things begin to unfold for the field? Yeah, if I if I had to if I had to put, you know flip one switch you know for for all of this the mm -hmm. the, the most fundamental switch I would flip is to uh, make it clear and this is this is one reason why I do all this all this outreach is is I want to get across one very simple idea from which everything else bioelectricity and a million other things flow from 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 this one idea mm. the one idea is this uh, and and I'm certainly not the first person to say this there have been plenty of other people banging that drum uh, you know for, for for years but I think we found some we've we've been able to advance the idea and and, and come up with some really good um, uh, sort of killer apps that kind of show that this is that this is real well th this is the switch that I would flip that the idea that the level of chemistry uh, for 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 understanding and control is just an assumption that that is not necessarily the way the 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 optimal level it's not a matter of reductionism people sometimes say well we want to reduce you say look if you're a real reductionist you'd be talking about quantum foam do you want to talk about quantum foam in these things? No, 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 that's stupid. <laughs> chemistry, chemistry is the. You way mean about. go from chemistry to physics? Uh huh. Well, yeah. well, and 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 below, right? So, so and the below. fact that the, the fact that you don't want to talk about quantum foam, you really just want to talk about chemistry. You do want to choose a certain level in the middle. Tells me you're not a real reductionist. You would like to stick with a particular level. Fine, <laughs> but let's uh -huh. be clear. Let's be clear. That is a philosophical choice. That is not actually. Uh, no one said that that's actually the best. The, the you know the best level. So Den and Dennis Noble is one of the best uh, people uh, that's been talking about this for for decades about a pr no privileged level of biological causation. So no so privileged so level. Okay, so he's not privileging the cell. He's just saying let's deprivilege some things. 
Correct. Now, some people, some people absolutely privilege the cell, and I think even that's wrong. I think even that's, you know, a few people uh, are now waking up to uh, this idea. They say, "Oh, it's not the, you know, it's it's not the gene; it's the cell." I'm like, "Okay, but you're making the exact same error. Uh, yeah. It's better, be better, but 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 still the same error because what we need to what we need to understand is 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 this." Uh, you don't know what the best level is until you've tried the tools of other disciplines that are appropriate for other levels of organization. And let's understand that intelligence and, and goals are not some magical thing. I mean, there's so much magical thinking left over from the pre-scientific age. Even, you know, even these very hard-nosed, you know, supposed molecular biology kinds of reductionist people are carrying off in some very uh, pre-scientific notions about human exceptionalism, about this idea that goals are for humans. You used to be an oocyte. When, when do you suppose these goals uh, showed up, right? Mm -hmm. Development is a slow, gradual process. There is no magic lightning flash that turns a bunch of chemistry and physics into, into real goals. And uh, we have to understand that, these, that, that we are not magical and that um, these kinds of things that are uh, amenable to uh, engineering approaches, so memories, uh, uh, preferences, um, uh, learning, counterfactuals, goals, all of these visual illusions, all of these things, they don't just show up in brains, they're as old as, as life itself. And we can use all those tools to take advantage of the competencies of the material. The biological material is, is in, it's insanely competent at various problems. Every level of, of, of organization solves problems. And all of this is an amazing toolkit for us to take advantage of, not just the chemistry. So, so, you, so, so, we, so you would say you're a, reduct, you're a reductivist, a reductionist. Me? Yeah. Me? No, no, I'm absolutely not a reductionist. You're not a reductionist. Oh, okay. You're no, not a reductionist. No, absolutely, absolutely oh, not. Okay. Yeah. Now, where can I learn more about this? For instance, we don't have time. I want to learn more about how the memory is kept in yeah. the, is it in the structure of the ion channels and the gaps? Um, because with the genome, you know, it's literally in some letters, yeah. right? It's in um, data. Um, yeah. And and so, I want to learn other things. So so how can I learn more? Are there conferences? Um what are you hearing from people? You know, I've been watching sure. your videos for a, a couple of years now. What are you hearing back? Is 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 a new uh, field emerging? Sure, sure. So so a few things. Uh, first of all, there are pointers. Um, you can put it in the show notes. Uh, we have an incredible amount of information on our website. There's papers. There's probably 300 papers just from our lab alone where I talk about all this kind of stuff in you know excruciating detail. So okay. I will. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you some some uh, pointers to where people can go. Uh, I, I want to be clear. I, I am not the only person in this field. Uh, I, you know, I, we're we're standing on the shoulders of some of some amazing thinkers for for decades back that didn't have the tools that that we have now. That weren't thinking about this as a cognitive process, but they understood how important bioelectricity was. We now have the ability to really sort of dr drive this home. And there are other labs, you know, people like Min Zhao and Emily Bates, and you know, pl plenty of other people who are who are working in this field. We do have conferences. There have been Gordon conferences um, in the last uh, issue of the. Um, the last uh, uh, development by the last Gilbert developmental biology textbook had three of our stories in it. Um, so, so I think this is this oh, is that's now great. this yeah. is now a well-known thing. You know, we are probably you know we're with their stories in Cell and Development and Journal of Neuroscience and all these other places. So it is it is not a niche kind of topic anymore. It's it's expanding, but um, more people you know more young people coming into the field is always better, which is the main reason I do this, this outreach is because my, my target is this, is the students. It's the, it's the grad students and the, the post next generation. It's the next generation who are not yet fixed in how they're going to do their science. What, what's the closest therapeutic we have that would come from this kind of thinking? Yeah, I think, um, so, so people like, uh, Min Zhao and, uh, Marco Rolandi, uh, have wound healing kinds of things. Um, for my lab, I think it's going to be cancer therapeutics and, uh, and some birth defect solutions after that, um, limb, limb and other organ regeneration. I mean, that's, that's going to take a bit, but I think have I you think started some company, a uh, company or companies for the cancer. Yeah. Abs yeah. Absolutely. We've got it. We've got a cancer uh, spinoff. We've got a, 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 a limb regeneration spinoff called Morphoceuticals Inc. We've got, uh, you know, um, another effort in, in aging and cancer called Astonishing Labs. Uh, there, there are a number of companies that have started off of this. If you could have a better tool, you talked about the tools you're designing to, to create this um, different uh, voltage and the voltage dies. Um, if, if, is there a tool that you, you know, you fantasize and, and you want, I mean, I guess you could build it yourself. Um, but that like a tools company could focus on and get to you. 
Absolutely. Yeah. We talked yeah. to a lot of tools companies on the program. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, one thing that would be absolutely fantastic is to take some of the um, voltage reporter reagents and instead of light, uh, couple them to some sort of um, CT, ultrasound, MRI modality such that we could get uh, real time voltage maps throughout the tissue, t tissues that we can't see. That is a tool. Now, now there's plenty of work to be done. Like that isn't stopping the work. We there's a million things that can and are being done even with the existing tools. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking tools, that is a tool that that needs to needs to be developed. Right. So like we had the leap towards next generation sequencing, right? Which that's giving a map of the genome. Uh, so it's, this it's this start. is basically a mapping uh, voltage mapping tool that would yeah, ramp it, things, change things by ten times, by a hundred times. You know. It, it 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 would, but but let's let's just just to be clear, this is not an exercise in amassing large data. All that data, and much like the genetic data, is not going to be useful until we actually crack the code. Which means to take seriously the idea that all of these uh, uh, voltage imaging data are snapshots of a of a of a, 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 a different collective intelligence than we're used to thinking about, and we need to understand. Uh, we need to communicate with that collective intelligence. That, that's the goal of this. It's not just to, to, to amass a large voltage data set. That by, by itself, that doesn't do the trick. It's the next step of interpretation, and which is, which is what we're developing the tools for now. Oh, okay. All right. So you're working on those tools. This has been so much fun. And and thank you. You've gone the you know you've gone the whole distance with me, um, and we could say more. Uh, just finally, what what would stand in the way of these kind of things happening? Uh, I, I, well, uh, I mean, what stands in the way is inertia and the fact that anything new, I mean, we're all busy, uh, you know, um, nobody has uh, the time, unless this is really your thing, nobody really has the time to get caught up in some field they've never heard of. So this is part of why I do all this kind of outreach so that, so that people, uh, when they're going through their education, uh, do know that, that it's here. But on the long term, I, I don't think anything can stand. I mean, science eventually, you know, the truth wins out. So um, I, I really don't think anything is is going to stand in the field. But but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of inertia, which means that uh, people like like us in this field have to do the hard work of making it obvious to everybody why this is interesting. Which means it's on us to drive the, the applications. Mike Levin, professor of biology at Tufts University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.